I wanted to talk for just a couple of minutes about um, why uh, we thought to do a series on holiness. Um, and I want to start with a, a quotation by uh, Max Weber. He said, the fate of our times is characterized by rationalization and intellectualization, and above all, by the disenchantment of the world. The disenchantment of the world. Precisely the ultimate and most sublime values have retreated from public life. So it strikes me that um, we live in a world in which it can be very hard to talk about uh, things like holiness. Uh, we're used to talking about things that can be uh, explained, that can be measured, quantified, demonstrated. It's, it's uh, hard. Um, it, it's a world that Weber described as disenchanted, right? Um, and it's hard to talk about those things uh, that belong to a world that was still an enchanted world. And holiness sort of belongs um, to that other world. And it can be difficult for us to uh, access it, to be conscious of it, um, and even sometimes to talk about it. Um, instead, we talk about all sorts of other categories. And very often I've found um, people will use the word holiness, but they'll talk about what's holy in terms that really is about something else. They'll talk about uh, what's ethical. They'll talk about what's uh, something that doesn't harm anybody. Right? Those are important categories. Uh, but they're not necessarily the same as talking about holiness. Um, and it strikes me that if we reduce um, discussion about holiness to other categories, like what's good to do uh, or what's ethical, then in a sense we've emptied holiness uh, of its own content. Right? Then we've made it a dispensable concept. It doesn't really add anything to the discussion. Unless holiness stands for something other, something additional, something different, um, then it's not really a concept that has any value and we may as well just talk about the ethical and, and, and holiness brings nothing uh, to the picture. Um, on the other hand, I've also found that, um, and I see this more and more, uh, that in contemporary discourse, at least among a certain uh, kind of uh, person, perhaps people who are searching for spirituality in a world that has been disenchanted, um, that the word holiness often gets used uh, in a way that kind of relates to everything. And I'll, I'll give actually a couple of examples of this. Uh, I was in a bakery recently and there was a beautiful um, stone plaque that was just put in uh, recently. Um, and it has uh, the following quote, it says, all life is one and everything that lives is holy, plants, animals, people. All must eat to live and nourish one another. Beautiful. I have no idea what it means, other than that we're about to buy things in the bakery. And then there's a there's a song that um, my attention uh, was brought to recently um, by a, a folk singer named Peter Mayer. Um, it's called Holy Now, and it begins like this: um, When I was a boy, each week on Sunday we would go to church. I'm sorry that I'm not singing it, but if I did, you would um, be great. <laughs> so he says, when I was a boy, each week on Sunday we would go to church and pay attention to the priest. He would read the holy word and consecrate the holy bread, and everyone would kneel and bow. Today, the only difference is everything is holy now. Everything, everything, everything is holy now. But it strikes me that if everything is holy, then that's not really so different as saying that nothing is holy. Um, or at least that holiness has lost its meaning as characterizing something that's different in some way from things that might be considered not holy or things that might be considered even unholy. Um, if holiness doesn't mean that something is different from other things, then it once again becomes, I think, a kind of a dispensable concept. In Jewish tradition, we have a very different idea, and we say to every Motzei hey, Shabbat, right? as Shabbat comes to a close, we say, Hamavdil being kodesh lechol, right? That God distinguishes between that which is holy and that which is not holy, um, which seems to be fundamental to what holiness is. That holiness is something that characterizes some things and uh, that does not characterize other things. Um, we continue being or lechosha, where the God is the one who distinguishes between light and darkness, right? That very first uh, distinction at the beginning. Uh, of the creation story, the book of Genesis, right? that God distinguishes between light and darkness, and that distinguishing is part of God's creation, that like creation involves distinguishing, and it suggests that that ability to distinguish between light and darkness, or between holy and not holy, is absolutely fundamental um, to the way the world is, the way the world is, and the way the Torah is asking us 
um, to look at the world. So the question is, what is that, right? If it's not the case that everything is holy, um, and if it's not the case that holiness is just a way about talking about something that we could talk about in other terms, right? if we really want to think about what holiness is um, and what the Torah is asking us to do when it says, Kedoshim to you, be holy, right? this seems to me a, a very difficult challenge uh, in, in the contemporary world. Um, and that's why we thought to do, uh, to do this series. It's really an attempt to um, help ourselves break through some of these obstacles that I mentioned and others that I haven't mentioned. Um, to help us refocus on Kedusha, on holiness, um, as a category that's not reducible to other frameworks, um, to attune ourselves to the possibilities of experiencing holiness, and to cultivate an orientation toward living lives that aspire to fulfill the injunction, Kedoshim to you, be holy. So that's kind of the project we set out for us uh, over the three weeks. I know most of you had the uh, benefit of being in the workshops um, uh, a, a little while ago. I hope you'll continue coming. Um, the next couple of weeks. We're very grateful to our workshop presenters, um, uh, Ms. Naomi Mark in the background. In the back there, uh, Rabbi Steve Blanchard, who's also going to be giving the lecture tonight, and Dr. Sam Levins, who unfortunately had to go, but he has a bunch of delightful children uh, to take care of at home. Um, next week, we have um, Ariel Mays, um, who um, is going to be speaking about Hasidic texts um, about cultivating um, holiness. Uh, and the third week, uh, we will have a conversation between uh, Dr. Aaron Lee Smokler, who I think is here, are you here? And uh, Rabbi Roly Madelon, and they'll be talking um, as, um, as professionals in the Jewish world as to how they work uh, with the communities that they lead and the people that they educate um, to, um, to help them and to help them help other people make place for holiness in contemporary Jewish life. So, Hope you'll continue to join us uh, in the coming weeks. Um, you should all have a program. If not, you can get one on the way out. And that has uh, descriptions of all the sessions as well as presenter bios. And rather than um, go over Reverend Blanchard's bio, I give you Reverend Blanchard. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. All right, you can all hear me? Yeah. Um, not an easy topic, I was thinking, to, to begin to discuss for all the reasons that were already told us. We're very much used to reducing this category. We have a couple of other categories too. Tuma and Tara is also on that list. Of things that get reduced to language that really belongs to a different set of concerns, like ethical concerns or psychological concerns or sociological concerns. And if, if Moore was right that this is a the modernity has a certain amount of the eclipse of God built into our experience of it, the holiness, the eclipse of holiness is also part of it. We want to get past you know, possible. We're thinking, can it is it possible to think about Kedusha, holiness, as something that is beyond nature and naturalism, something that's beyond being explained in the ordinary way. And how would you find it? How does that work? Does that leave us with the concept of the unholy, the non-holy? What does sanctifying ordinary things actually mean? How does that operate, etc.? Okay. I will not give you the final answer to that question. <clears throat> For two reasons. One is I don't have a clue what that answer is. So if I told you it, I'd be lying, but I thought I did. The second is, this is an enormously complex issue. The recovery of, of categories of experience that once were enormously powerful in society, the recovery of them in periods of time where for a couple of hundred years they've been emptying out is not an easy process. It's like recovering revelation as a category in an era in which people just find it very hard to believe that God talks to anybody. And so, the notion of holiness that we're looking for is not going to be easily found. Okay, and I guess I'm asking you to think about what it would mean to look for it. In other words, what do we think we're looking for? What are we trying to be open to? How does that operate? Now, and, uh, I'm going to do it in a, in a different way than... than I guess a, a way that's become more usual to me now. I'm not going to go through every place in the Tanakh, in the Jewish Bible, where this talks about 
the verb adjectives. That's not going to be helpful. And I want to pick a couple of places and ask us to think about what classical com medieval commentators had to say. They're not the last word, but they're a good place to start. And I'm thinking of, of um, two of them. One is the, the, the very beginning. The creation story occurs. Day one, day two, day three, day four, etc. Everything stops at the end of day six, and Shabbat comes into being. And there is this very famous passage in which God does two things for the seventh day, for Yom HaShavii. One is V'yivare, he blesses it, and then in the same parallel, in that pasuk, in that verse, V'yikadesh. He also sanctifies it. So I thought to myself, what do classical abortion do with this first appearance of this Shoresh? Of what do they what do they think what does that mean, Vikadesh? He makes it sanctifies it. What does it mean? Rashi looks at the verse and he notices the obvious parallelism between bracha or blessing on the one hand and kiddusha, the holiness that God does on the other. And he wants to talk about what, what is it actually going to be. He, he picks, again, I'm summarizing here. He picks to think about man. He goes back to a, to a to rabbinic midrash that talks about the man. Okay. They gathered it in for six days. They had to stop on the seventh. Okay. So the bracha to begin with was that on the sixth day, they got a double portion. They got more than they would have gotten. And that it stayed into the seventh day and did not rot the way if they tried to gather too much, it would have on another day. There's a, it's a positive kind of thing, bracha. It's a goodness. It's something good that you get. And if you get more of it, you get more bracha. And so the Shabbat is blessed, in a sense, for Rashi, because the mana, that this mana that they're gathering in the desert, okay, gives you, you can get a double portion on the other day. What about the Vayikadesh, the sanctification. If the blessing is that you've got something more, what's that? Rashi retreats to a very fundamental position that he always takes, which is that on Shabbat they didn't gather them up. You don't do something. Holiness begins for Rashi with moving away or stopping or not doing something. Separating from something. This classic position which you find later in the other place we're going to think about, which is in Vayikra, in Leviticus, of Kedoshim Tiyu is that holiness always miss and in some way or other clearing or pushing away from something. He, is, he says, Perushim and Harayot, moving away from illicit sexuality. Holiness is, a, if, if Brachasm is a, an increased blooming of presence, then Kedusha is somehow or other a, a limitation, a fence, he calls it, a classic fence. On Erva, Rashi refers to as Kedusha and other places. He cites several other kinds of situations he uses to prove that it's the setting of fences and limits that's really very important. He insists, of course, when he did, when in Vayikra, he insists that Kedoshim Tihu is the same thing. But he, elsewhere, when he's discussing the notion of the word Kadesha, which means a female temple prostitute, what's this root doing in a situation like this? He says, because anything set aside for a special purpose will be referred to by this root. But to set aside something means, as in Kedushin and marriage, that you move away from one thing, and it doesn't really tell you. All right, so you don't violate the rules of REO. That means you don't do something. What, what, is there a positive sense? Are we looking, on this view, we're just looking for what we're going to move away from? Re-enchanting the world is what? To empty it up? It's been emptied of more prohibitions? It doesn't seem to be the kind of answer we're going to be looking for. And yet, we have to put on our list of what we're looking for, a willingness to encounter limits, a willingness to move away from some things, back to this distinction-making between light and darkness, differentiating. You're not going to be able to have everything that you want if you're looking for hope. And I think that's a really scary notion for moderns. First of all, we are imbued with what I would call sort of a modern sense, a liberal sense of what freedom is. It's a negative sense. Freedom means I get to do whatever I want. You can't interfere with me as long as what I do doesn't interfere with you. Negative. Negative freedom. And this sense of holiness setting up a kind of negative freedom, okay, 
it sort of steps on our feet that way. I mean, okay, I'm willing to, to, to avoid punching you in the face. I want to ride the subway too. Of course, we're going to make room for everybody to sit down. But more than that, more than we need to do, what, what, what's that? And what's, who's to decide? And we, we put that aside and think about that to begin with. Limits on sexuality, of course, imply holiness. But it does not follow that holiness doesn't exist outside of areas of sex. The limits piece, Rashi's way of phrasing it is, that limits are not restricted to the sexual arena. He picks that for the cases I'm talking about. But you can think in a minute of other classic cases in which Kedush or holiness is important. To use the, I guess, the contemporary cliche, you know, sacred centers, something like that. All of which are, over, are laden with limits. Okay, reproduction is a sexual area, but think of two others. One is the Shabbat we just mentioned. Shabbat is defined not just about positive things that one does on Shabbat, it's also defined by 39 categories of no. It's a stopping of the labor of culture creation. God builds for six days, God makes, and then he stops, and then the sex is, you stop too. You stop too. Well, we were never tempted to do the things that God does. I mean, maybe you have the special powers, but in my limited world, I don't make mountains, I don't make great lights, I don't create animal species, I don't do any of that stuff. What do I do? As human beings, we create culture. We build a culture around us, a material culture around us. So the first thing you do to, to make a thing, you back away from that. So it's got limits, sexuality or reproduction, which is another classic sacred saying of yourself, the Beit HaMikdash. Here's the temple. You think to yourself, what could be more hedged around with limits than what goes on there? Most people can't get in very far. Those that can't get in are very carefully circumscribing their behavior. We'll return to that and have a look at it. And the holiest place? Once a year, one guy. Everybody is so nervous about what it is to get near this that limits are enormously set up. They tie us string to his leg in case he doesn't try to pull him. So limits are certainly not restricted to the sexual area. So Rashi's asking us to think about okay. that we are looking for something that would require us to accept limits. And I think we should start off by noting that that is not what most people get into the religious game for. And we have to ask, will it be easy to do? We'll see that there's more to that in any case. Because as Rashi says, somehow or other, all three of these things, the Shabbat, the Beit HaMikdash and, and the re and covenantal reproduction, as you see, are all things that have special purposes. Tonight's not the night to go over it, but if I ask any of you, write down the special purposes that the, the temple served, the special purposes that the Shabbat served, and the special purposes the covenantal reproduction served, you would be writing from us. So it's not that they're just dancers. No, there's some kind of special purpose, but what is it? You look at Ibn Ezra, let's move on to another kind of way of thinking about it. Okay. Again, he looks at the same verse, Tosefet. We're going to add this. You're adding or increasing goodness. That's what it means that Shabbat gets an extra. What about this Kedushah part? What about this notion? He straightforward, just as if he were mouthing Rashi. No Malacha. We don't do Malacha. We don't do Malacha. Set, that would set Shabbat aside for him from all other times. This holy day is a day in which something is not done. Again, we're not used to defining things that way. Someone says, I am seeking for holiness. And the first answer is then learn what not to do. Learn what not to do. And he's saying, that's what, and that you look at that original, that, that kind of notion. The amazing thing is it gets to Vayikra. He gets to the, the, the to the to the Leviticus text of be holy. He says his he makes them a, it includes Gary and includes converts because they too are worried about sexuality. They too are warned about rather Arab about sexuality. And then he says, yeah, but it's more than sexuality. It includes worshiping other gods. That's also forbidden. Again, the negative definition. You you come into the realm of human sexuality, which for them is covenantal reproduction. That's what we're discussing. You come into this realm, they're focused on it, and says, just understand that incest and the limitations are crucial to mapping this place out. 
That's why it can't be, everything can't be holy. There's some people you don't have to live. There's some you do have to live. There's some animals you can bring to the temple, and other animals you cannot bring to the temple. There's some states of being you can be there, and some you can't be there. Then he says, of course, the same is true about worshiping other gods. You've got to give up the other gods. Much e more difficult task than we imagine. Remember, put yourself in the position of individuals for whom gods guarantee success and happiness in life. You show up someplace, you acquire what's the name of the local god. You probably have your own family god as well that helps your family do well. And now you want to know what the local god is like. Of course you can take your Hebrew god along with you. But you don't want to start alienating the local gods who are also important to discovery and success. And someone says you have to drop all of that if you want to do this stuff. You, want. you have to drop. Lo tatsura for the logma for a nechem is always first to two things sexual misconduct and, and some other worshiping foreign god. That's not easy to do. Again, it wouldn't be take a genius to figure out the, model, the, the modern equivalent thereof. If tonight you said to me, you can finish the talk, but only if you agree to make a list of everything you think besides God that guarantees your success and swear off worshiping it for the rest of your life, I'm going to have a hard time doing that. I still check my account online. Among other gods with a small g. And you can make your own list. It doesn't require me. You can make your own list. Whether it's how we look, how much we weigh, how much money we make, kind of job we have, who we're married to. There are a whole long list of little things, all of which have been local gods, many familiarly based and others sometimes culturally based. And if someone says, I want you to press the delete button on that in order to find holiness, that is not going to be an easy thing to do, especially in a world in which segmentation, as Lumen would say, modern modernity is based on segmentation. So we keep dividing ethics is over here, economics is over here, sociology is over here, politics is over here, sex is over here. Everything's got a little place for itself. And all of a sudden, I'm going to have to what? To give up the little God's place over there. I don't want to do that either. It's going to be difficult. And on the other hand, from the Ebenezer point of view, that's what you have to do. So whatever this holiness is, it's a radical kind of state from our point of view. It's different than... Comfortable. Someone said, I really would like a more comfortable life. That does not require a radical turning over of the universe in which you live. But the notion that we're going to rediscover Kedusha is every bit as troubling as the notion that we're going to rediscover God as a presence who reveals himself to us. It's as much of a challenge as that. And then you have a look at the, the classic place of the, of the Korbanot of the sacrificial service itself. Everything is gets involved. Nothing is left out. There is a who to this question. Who is allowed to do what? Okay, so the, the first thing, certain people yes, other people no. Anybody can slaughter one of the animals, but the rest has to be done by this. And some people can't even do the slaughtering. But you can't, first some people yes, some people no. Then there are more limits. Where is it going to be done? When, where is it going to be eaten? When, it, when you've done it. Some things you can't eat at all, some things you can eat. But you can't eat them wherever you want to eat them. Some places have to be eaten here, some you can eat in all Jerusalem, and nothing's going to be eaten in New York. And about how about when? It's not just place, an agent. The sanctification business deals with who gets involved, where it happens, and when it takes place. Even the eating of a second, you can eat it for so much time, and afterwards, you can't eat it. Forbidden to eat it after that. Absolutely. You can't even you can't even bring the sacrifice with the intent to eat it in the wrong place. Or the intent to eat it at the wrong time. All these rules are there, no question. This is a good time, that's not. What makes it valid, what makes it not valid? It's not a trip to the beach. It's somehow or other very important to know right person, right place. Right time under the right conditions. I'll rephrase validity there under the right conditions. So that you don't end up with no, no terror, with leftover or people or all the classic things like that. Time and place all sanctified with limits on persons, limits on time, limits on place. And then you're thinking to yourself, this sounds a lot like two things you've had before. First of all, it sounds like the Aristotle's description at the end of the Nicomachean Ethics as to what virtuous characters, how you do it. You can't get rules on Aristotelian view, 
What you develop is the kind of character so that it knows what the right thing to do with the right place at the right time is. So we haven't got very much past ethics. All rituals, ethics, aesthetics, classical rituals, drama, dance, all of them have the same. And what I just said about holiness could be said about them. Not anybody can participate in a production of a ballet. They've got to stand particular places. The actions have to be done at particular times. Some productions are valid and others are shambles. The same is true for playing Mozart Quartet or for painting a picture or for engaging in ordinary ethical behavior. The right person, the right place, the right time, the, and under the right circumstances. The careful analysis of Corbinot, I discovered, didn't get me anywhere. I expected to open up Zvachim and finish and say, now I got it. At least I understand something about the rabbinic conception of hope. So then I realized these particular features are characterized, characterized all social structures. So we're not looking for something new in that way. What is it that's differentiating again? Ethics also has limits. Also ethics, you don't have to wait for, for holiness to, to say no to incest. We keep getting negative kinds of definitions that don't tell us somehow or other What's going to happen? Even the Ramban, I love this. The Ramban, the classic Ramban, which I think people should read more carefully before they put it up in lights in Times Square. And that is, and he said, Kiddoshim to be holy. He points out the obvious. The Torah cannot give you in detailed descriptions of, uh, of exactly how to behave under any circumstances. How You're allowed to eat kosher food, but how much? You're allowed to have a sexual life, but how much? And he says, a person could turn out to be involved in Bishut HaTorah, really the sort of disgraceful person, living a self satisfied like stuffing your face with, you know, and drinking wine to excess. So you could do all these. The Torah doesn't really want us to do that, but it can't give you precise details. So the Kedusha is about increasingly setting limits in these areas so that you get more and more capable of limiting the amount you eat, the amount of sexual activity you have, etc. All right, there's an underlying ascetic, really ascetic tone to that Ramban, if you read it carefully. You, you see that that's true. This is not a guy who discovered a leaf name short of Dinma. There's a lot of things that are left out. But the bottom line is, again, yes, of course, but I can set limits to things like eating or drinking or sex for reasons that have nothing whatsoever to do with what you want to call kadosh. I can do it for ethical reasons. I can do it for aesthetic reasons. It's ugly to watch somebody dribble all down because they ate too much. It is ugly. It's unhealthy to engage in way too much sexual behavior. All those things are possible. It tells us that, of course, this is necessary for holiness, but it doesn't tell us what gets us past the same things that are necessary for other things that we do. I mean, back to the Corbinot analysis. What happens when you're with the proper person, the proper time, with the proper action? So what's going on? What is going on? And as I said, for modernity, this is not an easy task. Most of us, if a person's tempted to search for Kedusha, for holiness, telling them that the first step is the setting of important limits is not likely to make friends. On the other hand, it seems to be a truth that they want ours to articulate. But this, that means that for some people, they're just going to be tone deaf on the signal. They're going to they're going to end up as you're going to, they're going to turn it into the sacred is something that's associated with religious activities. The priest lifts this thing up, therefore it's a sacred object. The Torah sits in a in an ironic kodesh, therefore it's a sacred object. Meaning a sociological definition. It functions within religious context, and therefore it's considered to be holy. That is not more than an actualist explanation. But it's a very tempting way to go because the alternative of asking yourself, what is there beyond, what's going on with all these things? Now, the strangest thing, when I started looking at it, I found an interesting thing in the Sephorno, which began to make me think about what the answer to this question was. I mean, the, the begin, in, in Bereshit, in Genesis, Sephorno functions, focuses on bracha. 
But as we get on into Vayikra, he has more to say. But even when he's talking about a little bit about this whole notion of what's happening on Shabbat, he has one thing to say. The blessing of Shabbat is that you get an additional soul. Okay, and then he uses a lot of light images. There's more of light on Shabbat. So this is coming from the notion of a sort of illuminationist theory. You know, you can see things that you can't otherwise see. Knowledge is an illumination. You walk into a dark room, you don't know what is around you. So you turn on a light, bingo! Now you know what's around you. You meet somebody. Okay, you don't really get what they're talking about. Then all of a sudden it's a cartoon. A little bulb goes off in your head. Now I see what it is that you're telling me. Now I see. I see because the lights went on. So illumination has been a very strong notion. And he, he insists that on Shabbat, this extra soul is capable of contacting this kind of pre light presence. But how is Kedusha, how is holiness related to what he refers to as Orachayim, the light of life? It's the light of life that's made available. It's the light of life. Imagine being in a world which all things are lit. Not dark, but lit. But when you get to Vayikra, where it carries on at quite an extent. The dwelling of the Shekhinah, the presence of God in, in our world, is what makes the people of Israel holy. That's the first thing he says. And the holiness that the people of Israel has is that they are made ready for eternal life. Now you begin to get the picture. He thinks that Kedusha has something to do what makes Israel whole is not just that it's set aside, that it plays a special role. And it's not just that it has limits as to how it can be had. But somehow or other there is this positive experience of God's presence which transforms the human experience from, from the limit, I'm sworn to you, from limits of space and time that you and I experience into something that's eternal. We leave behind the temporal. Not something that we're going to be happy from, because we know that everything's contextual, so we're going to have trouble with that one. But for a moment, he says, stop and imagine a day whose holiness is that God is present in such a way that you have the orachai, meaning that you are ready for eternal life, not just for your own purposes, but for more than that. He insists equally that Israel is a holy people because it realizes eternal life. Step out of space-time limitations for a moment. Imagine eternity. Time gone. And he, he takes all the detailed areas in which these things apply and insists that they do apply. Of course, he's very concerned about separating yourself from the things that block you. I'm going to use another term, pollute you. There's not a good notion of how to understand a tumantara. You're involved in circularity. I used to do it by saying, well, you're, whatever makes you tame is what blocks you from going to a sacred center. But if I then turn around and say, it's a sacred center because you're blocked when you're tame, that's circular. So I'm not going to do that. The, the, the concepts rise up together in some way or other. But we all know what not feeling right about doing something. So we know what pollution is about in social areas. We know how you know, you're sitting... So we, people do things that sort of move them out of your presence without you even thinking about it. Um, the, the sociologists say, and this is Michel Lamont, you know, you're having dinner with somebody and they start to pick their teeth with their credit card and you realize there's someplace else than you are. Okay, that might be the case. But he says, you go down the list, he's not talking about what people do that put them out. That's what you have to avoid. The kind of sexual behavior that would kick you away from the orachai, this light of life kind of sexual behavior that would take you, or, or behavior in the Beit HaMikdash that would take you away. Anything. He has a list, and the list tells you all the things you're not surprised about. One is, let's just go down the list. One is, since reproduction is covenantal, and since the body, you're going to have all the laws of Nida are in his mind. By the way, that from a traditional Jewish point of view, the temple is destroyed in 70, and the, the ability to contract the sacred center is gone, because we all end up what? Two mimics. We're blocked off by the fact that we're constantly in contact with death, and the temple is the center of our life. There is one remaining center of sacred life that, conti that continues where these laws apply, and that is reproduction, sexuality, and reproduction. They continue to apply. Okay, but it's connected with a whole bunch of. You need bodily integrity. The whole. He has a notion of. You see, he's looking. He thinks for shlemut, for wholeness, for bodily integrity. So he has a list. Body leaks. Of course, when the body starts, lots of ways the body can leak. 
All of these things, all of these, so to speak, are sin. He has all this body, the sinfulness, demons, and evil spirits. We shouldn't start leave them out either. Illicit sexual has a whole long list of things, which if you get involved with them, you have a hard time realizing the presence of the Shekhinah that makes, takes you away from eternal life. And it's true. I was thinking to myself, just as an experiment, I thought, it's true. All the things that are listed tend to get in the way of getting out, out of one's context and seeing anything larger. I mean, maybe you're different, but when the, when the body doesn't seem whole, we get nervous. We get focused. We get overly focused on that. And things are problem problematic. And, I mean, I'm sure none of you have demons, but my own demons keep me up at 2.30 in the morning. They don't liberate me. They focus me in on the limits of space and time. They don't make eternity available to me. What they make available is all the trivial things that I'm worried. How am I going to pay that bill tomorrow? How am I going to do that? To be liberated from those things, he's saying, again, it's not the only possible definition. We're looking for the direction to go in. He thinks that what? There's a dimension of human experience is the wrong word. Because the minute you go in this direction, if you define it as an experience, then someone will say to you, how do you know your experience is true? We start out with there's a subject and an object that I have an experience of. And how do you know you're really experiencing the Shekhinah? How do you know you're really doing that? Recovering these categories means you drop that model of I'm over here, the world's over there, I'm perceiving it. And you put relationship first. Encounter comes first. When you're encountering somebody, it'd be crazy if someone said to me, what'd you do? I said, I gave this talk at Trisha. Oh, really? Was anybody there? Sure, there were a lot of people. How do you know? All you had was experience. I mean, I had experience of tables, experience of drawers, experience of people. How do you know? Maybe you're, you're inventing it all in your head. And I would say that question's off the table. Yeah. Know, how do I know? I'm encountering. I'm seeing more. We're encountering. We're talking about right here. What's he doing about it? That has to be, in this view, this, you, some of these things make it hard to do that. Demons get in the way. They whisper in your ear. And they're all, all the demons and all the sinfulness and all the evil experiences and all the things you're going to get rid of are all things that are going to fit very neatly into sociological, ethical, or psychological characters. They will fit neatly. Evil spirits can be limited. That's the spirit that whispers that they're not listening to you. They're all going to get up and walk out of the room. You'll probably get a three on your evaluation. Okay? Little spirits, there's little limiting things. That you can understand in terms of psychology and sociology. Kedusha pushes it away in this view. It says, imagine what has if you weren't worrying about those things. You weren't worried about body leaks, you weren't worried about sinfulness, you weren't worried about demons, you weren't worried about anything you listed. You were worried about thought. The, the, in the one thing, in the, in, the, in the encounter, which gets you past the limits of things toward the Orochim. You're looking for something like that. And he insists that the holiness is the imitation of God. HaKavadan quoting the whole Ele. All of these warnings have as their intent, and if you want to know why are all these negative things there? Why is there net why are these limits being set up? The intent of all of these warnings, all of these limits, who is that you will become holy. The point of them, and this is that they should what become like God to, to their creator. So, if the, my question was, all the negatives, the backing off, the don't do it, is there somebody out there who says, yes, but at the end of the day, there's something that will come in that it, it, it's to you? And the answer, he, he provides the answer, yes. The answer is, you become godlike. This is why they've been set up. If you leave these things in place and don't eliminate them, if you don't follow those rules, you'll be blocked from experiencing you will be blocked from experience the eternal. And anything that does that is a form of, quotes, two more pollution. It keeps you out of the sacred centers and moves you another place. So in the end, I realized what actually is going on, I think, in this kind of Kedusha, in the sources that I saw, is Kedusha is the attempt to find those limits which create genuine open space for something that can be part of your life that is not part of your life 
as a sociological, psychological, or ethical risk. It's something else that emerges. We have different words for it. You say, well, what does that mean? The space gets filled? Filled with what? You create this big space in your experience, not this, not that, not this. Here is this great empty space in my, in my life. What's coming into the space? And you say, gee, the, the metaphors I told you don't, may not immediately resonate. Light came into the space. Life sustaining or life gets into the space. It's God who steps into the space. That's Shina. Or if you're in Heideggerian mood, maybe being with a capital B space steps into the space. But that, of course, is the question, isn't it? If you got everything back out of the way, what would be there with you? What would you encounter? And what Madari does is to make that space filled with something else so you can't open it to this. So the search for Kedusha is the space for an encounter. And the question is, do you prefer encounters with what's or with who's? Encounters with the what's suggest that when they clog the space, some object will come and emerge. My personal thought on this was that probably the wrong way to go. I'm over here, and there's an object over there, and I've made a space, and the object comes out, and I see it. Because I think once you start to think that way, the first thing you'll imagine to yourself is, Am I kidding myself? There I was, sitting in my, my, my house, and I, I just finished learning a parak of Tanakh, feeling very good. I stopped for a moment, and I could feel this space. And into the space, somebody tells you, God, the light of God came. You said, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that like? You lost your mind. <laughs> Prove to me it was the light of God and not like a, a illusion of the devil. So if you're looking for objects, I think you're going to have a harder time. I think that the capacity of the human subject to demonstrate and justify the perception of a transnatural object is gone after modernity. And the attempt to re-access re, 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 re it will be a mistake. You don't, you don't trust me, you can try to do it. You go on and see if you can do that. But every attempt that's been made to say, I cleared space. I stopped cluttering up my life with the wrong kind of ethical things. I stopped cluttering up my life with the wrong the things that get in the way of seeing what's right in front of me. I redeveloped mindfulness. I did all of it. And then I found something. Everybody tried to, somehow or other, that ends up with a phil, in modernity, with a philosophical critique that eliminates it as, as something you can really rely on. On the other hand, I think Buber's right on this, or we want to say, according to Sforno's right on this, you can have it either way you like. If it's a space for an encounter, the other possibility is with whom? With whom? In other words, who are you looking for out there? And my advice would be don't decide that question now. But they're going to stop asking what to call that thing because if you label it God, they're going to start giving you a hard time immediately. Which God? Then all of a sudden they press the theology button. And the next thing you know, before you have any holiness on your hands is a new concept, what you have is another theological conversation. In some way or other, there has to be an openness. It's exactly the same circumstance, I think, as recovery or revelation. For some people, it will be possible to recover, as, as um, Leo Strauss says, difficult but not impossible, is to recover an encounter with that which transcends ethics, sociology, economics, that which wants to explain away and all experiences, really just psychological experiences or natural experiences. And we will be looking for the metaphors. To a certain extent, older metaphors, I think, will be helpful for people, to a certain extent. Although if you look at modern discussions of these topics, the discovery is usually not couched in classic sort of like light. You're not going to hear sophorno like words. On the other hand, in rough cook it is. So you'll have to decide. But what, if, it, if you're sitting here thinking, OK, I came to this because I really would like to think about recapturing what holiness is about. I'm not sure you can recapture it for anybody else. Okay. What I suggested is we're going to be there two, two motions you're going to have to make. One is going to be a willingness. Thanks very much. One of them is to be willing to, again, go over all the areas of life and clear space. Clear it out by accepting some limitations. Okay. And then you're going to be resting what those limitations are. 
And study of Allah is a great way to get started, but if that's not your thing, there are other ways to get started. Okay. On the other hand, then you have this space, and you say to yourself, but what's there? And I say, I don't have a clue. What you need to be, what we need to be, is open to what comes into that space, to who comes, or my view, who comes into the space. If you try to say in advance and dictate what will the encounter in that space be like, you'll kill it. And I would say the following. Imagine, I ask you a simple question. What went on in the Holy of Holies, in the Kodesh Kodeshim, that one time a year? Everybody, that, that's the place. That's the place. One person gets to go in. And we've decided we're not going to take a video camera in there. That's not going to happen. We're not looking for video camera entities. What went on in there? Do you have a clue? Something scary. I expect that anything powerful will be scary. Something that required a lot of rules. Very careful about what the Kohen Gadol was talking about. Something which all of life depended on. You were betting your life by walking into that place. You walk in and you didn't get it right. You could be dead. And it could pull you out with a string. You bet your life that you're clearing this space for something really worthwhile. And nothing I say or anybody else says will prove to you that you did it, and nothing that anyone else says will undermine it once you've been there. But what is it? We don't have descriptions of what happens in the Holy Spirit. We have loose suggestions as to what happened. But we have no idea what's I think that's great. Recovering the kind of experience which has enough, quotes, mystery, end quotes, to it. That you could actually say, I can't tell you in advance what will be there. It's a great move. Modern Kedusha, I might do. Again, everybody has a view on this. Modern Kedusha, I might do. We have the recovery of the willingness to enter into a world that has not only limits, but has really powerful presences that you can't dictate to in advance. And if you say to me, I don't know what you're talking about, then I'd say, you know, it's no different than if you'd ask me to talk about recovery of revelation as a category. Another difficulty is great that we have that. For some people, God's just gone. He's not in the universe anymore. He doesn't talk. He doesn't speak. He's out. Forget it. All you have is records. It's always a third-hand account. I can't. I can say it's, it, it may seem difficult to do. I grant it's difficult to do. But it's certainly not impossible from the point of view of someone who thinks he's experienced it. Someone who's had it, it's not impossible. And once you get rid of the limits and become... But you can't... God's not going to speak to you if you're a manovo, if you're a jerk, and Kedusha won't be available if you want to be a jerk. So that's what I suggest. Very simple, straightforward, you know, after all the fancy proportions of stuff is done. The bottom line is very simple. Kedusha is about the clearing away of the limits and the opening up of the space and the discovery of what holiness is. And if you say define it, I would say, if I define it, I'll kill it. If I tell you what you're going to find, I'll kill it. If you say, well, I'm only going if you tell me in advance, okay, then you won't get there. It's like waiting for God to speak to you. Tell me what he's going to say. I can't. And if I insist I tell you in advance what he's going to say, he'll kill it. So that's a way to go forward. He didn't tell you the answer. It says things to think about over the course of the session. People will come in. I hope when they do the Hasidic thing, they'll talk about how Hasidim, Hasidim also told you. This is when you get in, the, the thing that enlivens everything that supports all being, capital B. You'll be looking for that. And take, taking three weeks in a row out of your life to think about, will I be willing to open myself up to this kind of space, to create this kind of space, take this kind of risk, can't be the worst thing that could happen for you personally or for me personally. And in any case, whether it happens on a societal level, I don't know. But I applaud Grisha for going to say, we need to talk about it. We need to somehow or other stop shoving it into reduced categories. We need to say those things are good social explanations of what this kind of thing was, but they don't capture what it is. You can, you can be an expert in the psychology of sacred behaviors and you not have a clue. As a friend of mine used to say, he used to say, he wrote a book on the nature of religion. It sold pretty well. I said, but you don't believe in anything. He said, no, I'm tone deaf on the sacred. He said, I'm tone deaf on what's he said, but I can see that other people are not. So I pay very careful attention to what those people are like. You can do that, you can still do that.